So I will give an intro in, in just a second, but just to kind of set the stage for everyone. Uh, obviously, we're in the Blue Team Summit here, so we really want to focus on defense. Uh, and a little bit behind, you know, where I was coming from with this talk is, um, you know, first, I think overall, um, there's a lot of doom and gloom in this space, but I do think we as defenders are winning uh, and really wanted to focus on building off of the momentum that we have. So I started working on this talk a little while ago. And what I wanted to do is be able to pull from some of the real world attack techniques that we're seeing uh, and that we're seeing over and over again, these things that continue to work in the real world and figure out, you know, how do we actually defend against these? Uh, more often than not, we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, misuse or abuse of legitimate tools, legitimate processes. And, you know, from a defender perspective, that's frustrating because now you're constantly looking to find the needle in the haystack of, is that a legitimate action or has that user been compromised, right? So what I wanted to do is figure out, well, let's build something around what we're seeing from a real world attack scenario, uh, and then work on building out defensive measures. Uh, so with that, uh, I've spent the last decade or so uh, in a cybersecurity consulting um, background. So kind of listed out a, a quick path there. Um, really what I do now is run an offensive security consulting team. And uh, I think that gives me an interesting perspective where uh, we're in a lot of different environments. We're seeing a lot of issues from an attacker perspective, uh, but we're also seeing a lot of unique approaches to some of the things out there and some interesting solutions. So uh, again, with that in mind, I'm seeing a lot of different attack issues out there. And then really, you know, we're seeing these headlines um, and, and it's frustrating uh, to see because cybersecurity issues and breaches continue to get a lot of attention as, you know, a lot of these rightly should. Uh, but it's also sensational to only highlight these issues versus being able to focus on the progress being made. And really what was the jumping off point for me uh, this winter was uh, this tweet from uh, you know, our colleague, Andy, he heads up the uh, threat intelligence team at IBM X-Force. They put out their report. And what was really interesting here was uh, that the top action on objectives that they saw uh, through their incidents was a deployment of a backdoor. And that's actually really exciting. Um, for the point he calls out here is, yeah, that's that's bad if you're picking up, hey, there's a backdoor installed in your network, right? Initial reaction, oh, geez, we, we got to respond to this. But when you stop to think and see that in the past, the top action was ransomware, we're actually shifting left here. And this is good news. Uh, you know, again, I know it's restricted to the breaches and the actions that they're seeing, uh, but it's actually really exciting that, hey, folks are actually starting to detect issues earlier. And this is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really aiming to get folks thinking about how do we detect these things, right? Preventing a lot of the steps throughout the different attack chains is always the goal. But if we can also build in detections there, we can start responding quicker, we can start triaging, uh, and can really keep uh, moving the organization forward. All right, so with that, uh, great, it's easy to talk about uh, all sorts of theoretical attacks, right? And we can talk about that until we're blue in the face. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to pull from real world scenarios and continue to run up against the issue of various NDA requirements. Uh, and then luckily, what came to, to our view at the end of February uh, was CISA put out this red team report. And so it's interesting. And really, the first big takeaway for folks today is if any of this seems interesting from a concept perspective, go take a look at this report. Uh, the slides will be posted has all the links throughout everything we're gonna talk about today for you in the notes section. Um, and work through this, whether it's a tabletop or even looking at some of the technical um, aspects in your own environment, because what's great here is a few things. One, it was a multi-site, um, multi-location, you know, really mature environment for the red team to be testing in, uh, which I think is a good thing because we're able to see a lot of different attack paths that you may not think about in your own organization. Uh, what's also nice is they map all of their actions to MITRE ATT&CK. So if anyone hasn't hit that on the bingo card yet today, you can go ahead and cross that off. But I think that's a really functional way to talk about what attackers are doing. And what's interesting is all of the attacks that are tracked through this report, we're also seeing in real world attacks as they're being publicized. So again, everything in here being focused on real world kind of attack techniques, scenarios, uh, and what we can do about it. 
what was interesting is there were 13 directly actionable uh, events on the red team side of this scenario. Uh, it spanned a couple months for the full engagement. And only three were acted upon by the blue team throughout this project. And that got me thinking because this is, you know, obviously a mature environment. They're going through uh, a red team uh, engagement. I don't think CISA would be engaging if the organization wasn't ready for something this advanced. Uh, and it really speaks to the fact that even if we're doing things right, there's always going to be additional things uh, to focus on. So again, uh, call to action for you. Uh, any of the things that sound interesting today, go take a look at this report um, and really gives you a nice kind of play-by-play -play of the attackers that you can work through in your environment. All right, so what we're gonna do is walk through a couple of the key steps throughout this engagement uh, and talk about some of the uh, possible detective or preventive controls you could have in place. Everything here with the end goal of frustrating the attackers. Uh, you don't have to be the best. You really want to make sure uh, you know, you're better than the rest and you're able to uh, get the attacker to trip or stumble and allow yourself to respond. Um, so prob probably surprising to no one here today is the fact that phishing was related to their initial access vector. Um, to be honest, everything we're gonna talk about related to this is probably the highest effort item um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I will say right now, the answer is not more security awareness training. Um, this is something in the space, there's a lot of attention paid to that. And I really think we've seen enough years of phishing being the number one access vector and people saying do more security awareness training where you know I, I think we need to shift the focus. I think people are aware that phishing is a possibility, spear phishing, is always going to be a matter of right time, right place. And we as security professionals need to accept that fact and start to build the control environment around that. All right, so what they did here, they said uh, the phishing email was interesting that people don't always stop to consider is it wasn't a one email, here's the ISO to open and uh, get the malware and start uh, their attack path. That's what a lot of the simulations are, but here the attackers had an ongoing conversation with folks. So they were able to build the rapport. And again, that's going to defeat a lot of the security awareness training approaches because now they feel like they are interacting with a person. Maybe that first email was suspect, but we've been exchanging emails for a couple of weeks. And, you know, this is legit. And then they continue to go on. So the first thing here uh, to talk about is um, decoy personas. Uh, and one thing you may notice as we work through here, uh, again, to reference a, another framework, maybe on the bingo card, is the defend matrix, uh, kind of the um, peer or partner uh, group with MITRE. Uh, decoy personas, really the concept here is uh, taking the classic honeypot approach and applying this to a person. And we've seen this successfully deployed in a few different ways. And it really depends on the amount of resources, right? I know everything in here is, hey, we've got a day job to do. We can't also be managing a million social media accounts. And that's fine. You don't have to do that. One of the things you can do is just try and increase the likelihood that you're going to detect some sort of phishing attack. And one of the ways you can do that is creating some of these fake email addresses and planting them either in your website or in your um, you know, social media's personas, et cetera, in ways that seem innocent enough. Um, and they don't have to be a full-blown profile, you know, posting on LinkedIn or Twitter every single day. Um, you want it to look legitimate enough to be kind of caught in that first wave of screaming, screening from the attacker. So we want to be able to say, hey, you know what, if they're going to send some form of kind of low tier phishing email that maybe is going to get past typical spam filtering, but will be getting to end users, we want to try and make sure that this user account is caught up in that. Uh, so again, you can do this through, um, you know, placing on the website, you can create kind of a set it and forget it LinkedIn profile with the uh, credentials um, there. And even if it's not super active, it still can be effective uh, as long as people think it's a legitimate profile. Other places you can look to place this bait is uh, within the web page, um, within different blog posts, you know, news release, anything like that, where if this, uh, the attackers are looking to kind of scrape all of the potential target information, you want to be caught in that big net. Now, you certainly can uh, if folks do have you know, the security 
budget and resources to manage these in a more active perspective, that's only going to increase the likelihood of that person being targeted, right? Especially you get them in kind of an accounting HR related scenario. One of those people that attackers may want to go after, uh, th that would be great. But again, it doesn't have to be a huge lift. You can create some of these accounts and then set up the monitoring. It can That monitoring can be as simple as an auto forwarding rule in the email inbox. You can certainly go uh, more advanced, but again, here we're looking to just slightly increase detection odds in our favor. All right, so I know that that's gonna be difficult. Phishing is uh, kind of a perpetual issue at this point. Uh, so from here, the attackers, they got in the network. Um, they started to try and figure out where they were. Uh, again, folks, uh, if they've been through any pen tests or red team, they're probably familiar with uh, the attack path here. And the reason is this continues to work. Um, here, the attackers were starting to enumerate the environment. What are we, you know, where do we land? What sort of permissions do we have? Where can we go from here to try and escalate privileges, move laterally, access sensitive data, et cetera? Uh, one of the great things, if you're not already leveraging the um, graph theory in Bloodhound from a blue team perspective, I highly recommend that. This is something uh, attackers will do. Um, it's noisy, which then gives us, again, another chance to detect, hey, there, there's all sorts of LDAP queries firing off. Let's take a look at this. Um, but it paints a really good picture from an attacker perspective of how do I get from where I am now to where I want to be, you know, that privileged uh, access. So the attackers did this. Uh, this actually ended up being one of the items that was actioned on, uh, which is nice to see. Um, you know, the collection here did trigger some alerts and they quarantined the box. Unfortunately, not before a lot of that information was collected, uh, but goes to show that it is possible to flag off of this. Uh, some of the things you can look at here, uh, again, resources are in the, the notes section here. Uh, so we're gonna have to go a little quickly just based on the time, uh, but we can set up audit policies explicitly for detecting this kind of activity. There's a great blog post there pictured at the bottom uh, that I highly recommend folks go and read. Um, this is all about detecting this type of action, uh, again, with decoys. So um, that's somewhat of a common theme here today is they're going to walk you through the process step-by-step -step of creating different decoy user, computer, and group objects, and then helping define the audit policies to flag off of those. These are going to be things that need to look legitimate and again, get captured in that wide net. If the attacker is going to do something like Bloodhound uh, for enumerating and mapping out the domain, you want these things to get grabbed and you want them to be included um, and look legitimate. You don't want it to say, you know, detection user one, detection user two. Uh, you want those to be uh, caught in. And then as soon as those of, uh, audit logs are firing, that event ID, um, you're tailoring that to those specific uh, objects. And that's right away suspicious. Doesn't mean breach, but hey, either someone you know in IT is playing with a toy, maybe they, they don't necessarily know what's going on, um, or maybe you do have an issue, but it at least gives you a really great detection point to move forward and start to investigate. All right. So the attackers, unfortunately, uh, were able to gather enough information here to continue moving throughout the environment. Uh, at this point, um, they did find and exploit some unconstrained delegation uh, configurations and able to eventually go for a um, TGT attack. So, you know, at this point, um, the, this can be upsetting from a defender standpoint. This is kind of everything, right? The attackers uh, have compromised uh, a domain controller. They've compromised the KRB TGT account. They're able to issue uh, tickets for themselves. You know, golden ticket attack uh, is an issue. Um, so a few things we can do here. This is one where actually prevention is going to be a best case scenario for you. Now, uh, there's some really great um, blog posts linked here as far as how do we get ahead of this sort of attack? Because once uh, everything's gone, um, you're really fighting an uphill battle at that point. Um, with prevention, the biggest thing to keep in mind as far as resetting that KRB TGT uh, account password is that that has to be done twice for it to actually take effect. It doesn't matter what you set it to because that's going to be managed by Active Directory in the background, but it does need to be changed twice for the change to take effect. Um, that being said, we can't always prevent everything. So there are detection um, possibilities for you in a few different ways. One of them is specific event IDs on the domain controllers. 
that can be noisy. Um, some of the ticket options listed here will help reduce the noise. But again, this isn't something that's going to be automatic issue. This is, that's interesting. We need to go and look at this and figure out what's going on. Uh, what's another great opportunity for detecting this is script block logging in PowerShell. Again, not going to be automatic, but it's going to be a pretty good indication of something interesting is going on that we need to look into. And again, uh, some specific filtering on event IDs is available here. All right, so at that point, these attackers really have a significant amount of access in the environment. They started to move throughout the network, leveraging the access that they had. If they were moving laterally, trying to dump credentials, if they didn't have the right access for those workstations, they're going back to that golden ticket and just creating themselves a ticket to continue moving. And what they were doing is starting to do a lot of that local enumeration prior to moving. Um, so you'll see here some of these things that they're abusing, uh, specifically with SMB, are disabled in modern uh, versions of Windows. But we all know, we're. Not, I'd be surprised if there's anyone that has 100% modern uh, operating systems in their environment, right? It's a perpetual issue of chasing down, hey, we actually, this vendor requires XYZ, so we need to maintain this legacy box. Let's try and build around it the best that we can, right? We have that. Um, so how do we figure out how to detect when that's being abused, uh, figure out what legitimate use case of those um, protocols are, and then flag for the rest. So to be able to do that, we have a few different things. Uh, one of them, and, and really I think the best moving forward because it provides both a preventive and detective opportunity, is a tiered administrative strategy. And what I mean by that is you're going to have different assets with different sensitivities. The easiest way is, hey, let's look at a domain controller that's the absolute most sensitive needs to be protected machine. Below that, maybe we've got our member servers, some file shares, et cetera. And then below that, we've got the workstations. Uh, for a long time, we've been telling people, hey, you need to have different administrative credentials, right? You need to have your daily driver. That's what has access to your email and internet and everything else. But if you're going to do anything as an administrator, you need to have this Sean admin account. And that's great. We need to take that the next step forward and say, you know what, not only do you need a separate daily driver and administrative account, you need to have accounts created based on the asset tier you're working in. So if you're working on workstations, you've got a Sean workstation account, right? Servers, Sean server, et cetera. And doing that, uh, which gives you a few different opportunities. The first one is, say you happen to be logged in working, you know, supporting an end user. Um, the attacker's already in your network and they've got the local admin access. If they're going to dump credentials, that's not going to move them up the chain in your environment. Sure, they may now have an additional set of local administrative credentials that they didn't have before, uh, but you're keeping them moving laterally and not vertically. And that's the preventive, right? They won't be able to use those credentials against a server or a DC. The detective side of that is then tuning your audit logs and detection abilities to say, if Sean Workstation is all of a sudden logging into DC01, that's strange, right? The two things I like to say is, you know, it's similar to running uh, Who Am I? Either you've got an admin that's lost, that's a concern, we need to figure that out, or you've got an attacker. Either case, we need to investigate. And in addition to this is looking at something like LAPS or other uh, local credential management tools. And again, similar concept, we have the preventive abilities of reducing the value of each compromised set of credentials, as well as being able to detect on failed logins. Other areas uh, to look at here would be uh, network intrusion, right? So looking at things like Security Onion and starting to tune some of those rules uh, can really help identify some of this lateral movement. Why is, uh, you know, Sean Laptop talking to Jane Laptop? That, that's not normal, right? Let's investigate that sort of thing. And again, uh, looking to harden the network, making sure any of these remote access tools being used uh, are coming from trusted hosts or trusted network segments, either being able to block that at the local firewall level uh, or detect off of anomalies. As these attackers are moving throughout the network, um, again, surprising to no one, um, a bunch of users had credentials stored in insecure ways. And this is, you know, done through a few, few different ones. Um, bash history file with, you know, some typos, but then uh, maybe their command, you know, was one line off and they put their password in uh, by accident and didn't think about clearing that bash history. We've seen 
text files here, Excel files. Um, this is one of the ones you probably have this in your environment. Um, folks are, you know, just humans in general are not meant for storing all these different passwords. And if you're not providing them with uh, an easy and usable secure solution, they're gonna find another way around this. Um, so what do we do here? Back to deception yet again. Uh, we want to plant some of these credentials around and make them appear legitimate. Um, so one way to do this is using you know, valid credentials as far as a username with intentionally wrong passphrases. Uh, and that gives you a failed login uh, attempt uh, detection event. That's something to investigate. Again, um, if you're rotating these on any sort of frequency, you do need to make sure you're managing that and looking out for some of those false positives. Uh, but being able to plant some of these um, really helps provide with a specific failed login attempt that should be investigated, maybe at a higher priority than normal. You know, if it's Monday morning at 9 a.m. local time, you know, we're probably expecting to see a bunch of these because people are just getting in from the weekend and kind of rushing and anything else. Um, maybe that's normal. But if all of a sudden there's failed logins on some of these targeted accounts, that's something to investigate. The other thing to do is preventive is start to hunt your network for these files. I know your acceptable use policy says not to store passwords in text files or Excel documents or OneNote or email, anything else, right? But they're there and you need to go out and try and find those uh, and use that as a teaching moment with the user. And first look internally, are you providing them with a secure alternative? Make sure you're not saying you need to manage all these secure passphrases, but also we're not giving you any way to do that because the end user you know, is not a database. They're going to find a way uh, to write that down, to type it out, uh, and you need to help them do that in a secure manner. All right, um, command and control. So throughout this whole attack, uh, they're using Cobalt Strike and Merlin primarily for uh, their command and control activity. Um, what we're seeing here is, uh, again, uh, abusing uh, tools that everyone's aware of, and they're doing it in a way that they try and blend in. And really what you want to do here is uh, two things. Um, we're looking at the network traffic specifically, and two tools to uh, consider looking at here is either Rita or Security Onion. Um, and these are great. There's a, a nice uh, white paper that's linked here as far as using these tools specifically for detecting C2 traffic. Uh, this is something that you may not necessarily catch you know, the best of the best here. But if any attacker is, um, you know, kind of being sloppy or maybe they're going after multiple targets at once, they may not be paying too much attention to how they're setting up their C2, especially if they're just using some of this off the shelf software. You can start to catch some of those beacons because, hey, you know what? Sean's workstation is reaching out every five minutes that's not normal. That's an anomaly. Let's go investigate that. Or, hey, Sean's workstation has been connected to the server for seven hours straight. That's, again, not normal for an end user and gives us another detection capability there. As we're wrapping up just before uh, we take some questions, the last thing here is just to reiterate, there were 13 observable events. Um, so I know at the beginning I said 13 and 3. Uh, 13 and 4. The interesting uh, thing here is the fourth one um, is a little bit deceptive. The final action of the red team was to emulate a ransomware attack. They didn't encrypt any files, but they did place that ransom note and four folks reported that. So it's... Um, I guess you could take that either way as far as acting on it. Um, but the big takeaway from this piece is reevaluating what you are capturing from an audit log perspective. If you go back and take a look at that CISA report, there's an excellent table from which actions they took and what they would expect from a detection capability, whether it's local audit logs, security tools, EDR, XDR, network traffic, any of that, that's all called out. If you're looking for a place to start, as far as, okay, we need to start capturing audit logs. We don't know where to start from an audit policy. We don't want to capture everything and just be buried in noise or go bankrupt from our SIM bill at the end of the first month. Um, malware archaeology is the place I generally like to point people to. They've got all these cheat sheets set up. Again, and, you know, we're talking about mapping different attacker techniques to uh, the attack framework here. They've got a cheat sheet that will help identify specific event IDs to those tactic and technique IDs. 
Um, really great place to get started. Um, and just a quick um, visual, it's a lot of text, but the intent here is these are all the observable actions the red team took throughout this engagement. And you can see every single one of them had multiple ways of being able to detect that action. A, if it was being collected from an autolog perspective, uh, B, if it's being monitored um, in any sort of central repository, it's not going to help logging on end endpoints, and then it's going nowhere. That may help in the investigation. We're trying to get ahead of that. Um, and then B, making sure that you're setting up the rules to alert where possible. Um, all right, so with that, I know that's a lot. It's a quick session, uh, a lot in there, hopefully something for you folks to go back and start to look at in your environment. Um, I think there's a lot of good insight as far as what a real world attack can look like uh, that you can then take a look, you know, kind of go step by step, look back at your environment and try and figure out how would this play out with us. And with that, saved a couple minutes here for questions if there are any. Yeah, we've got a couple and thank you, Sean, for that. Okay. Um, there's, there's about, <laughs> unfortunately, like eight or nine sitting in the Zoom q and I don't know if you can see them, Sure, let me open. I did not have it open while I was going. Um, but let's see. Um, let's see, it looks like there's some from the others. Um, I don't know, Ashley, if you want to read some off, if you've been watching them for what would be best for the last few minutes here. Um, so the first one is how do we steer attackers to send a phishing email to the fake account instead of, you know, other email accounts that are listed on a site? Yeah, so uh, we may not be able to get it instead of, um, which is part of the concern, right? This target account, um, if it's getting the message, there's a pretty good chance other folks are as well. But this gives you the opportunity to go and hunt your environment and say, you know, what, we need to look at the rest of our end user emails. Who else got a message that's matching some of the attributes here, right? It may not be from the same sender, uh, which can complicate things. The whole intent is it gives you um, kind of that tickler of, hey, something might be going on in the environment that we need to investigate. Right. And that was kind of my guess is that it's not probably instead of, but in addition to. <laughs> um, right. Awesome. And then what tools uh, really force users to acknowledge app out connections like NetLimiter and acknowledge mode on Windows and Little Snitch on Macs, if you know? Um, what about tools that, yeah, I mean, that, that can be great. I think that's going to be um, difficult to manage in an enterprise environment, um, you know, but that can be great. And that's, I mean, the easiest way I like to talk about that is, you know, with iPhone app permissions. I think that's a great kind of teaching moment with non-technical people. When I talk about, hey, we need to pay attention to what we're doing on our workstations is now you get those prompts of all the different permissions of what is the app trying to do and why. And that is now helping people kind of stop to think and say, you know what, is this something I really want to be doing? Um, so those tools can be great. To be honest, I haven't seen that effectively deployed at an enterprise level though. Cool. And then another question, does your presentation apply to a fully Azure and remote end users environment as well? Yes. So the only issue is you start to run into um, some different complications as far as it's not going to be a direct one-to-one -one match. What you're going to want to do is look at the underlying kind of goals of each action and start to think of how that's going to apply in your environment. You know, one example being uh, lateral movement is going to look different in a traditional network versus you know, your fully um, Azure AD setup. Um, it's You still can look at how that's moving, but that's going to shift a lot of your focus around protecting identities uh, and looking at what sort of access and access attempts are taking place there. Awesome. Um... Uh, and question from a new person. They said, is there monitoring methods that can be applied to detect anomalies at every level described in the OSI model? And can alerts be developed for each of these? Probably, yes. But I would say we don't actually work in like the OSI model from a, a visual perspective. Um, in my opinion, we're looking at a lot of um, these specific actions itself. The OSA model is really useful for thinking about how, you know, the, the network is functioning, but um, doesn't necessarily map one-to-one -one with actions being taken in the environment.